Thank you very much. I would like to recognize and salute a senior com comrade and an elder in this country, my brother and senior, uh, Honorable, Honorable Minister for, for State for Energy, uh, Mr. Okosai. You are very welcome. In the, rest, the, the recent couple of years, there has been a general realization that the earth is no longer what it was 20 years ago. And energy resources largely are finite. If we are to develop this country and develop this continent, we must have a consensus that forms of energy that are not renewable are not sustainable. And today's introduction is an affirmation of this thinking that we can still achieve development in our various countries. The global north thinks that renewable energy is the way to go. And they have taken a number of strides to develop this thinking and to share the ideas with the rest of the world. The global south, Uganda inclusive, thinks that Whereas we are abundantly blessed with a variety of energy sources, it is important to exploit those energy resources that are renewable. And our partners, the International Energy Agency, has come forward to support this country and other countries in Africa, probably Sub-Saharan Africa, to put this agenda at the forefront of decision making. Now, this is best achieved when it is tackled from policy level. So this is why we are here generally. And we shall be getting different ideas about the, the strides that have been taken to achieve integration of renewable energy for sustainability purposes. So I ask you to be at ease. And we start today. I welcome. I welcome. Uh, the host of this function, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Energy and Mineral Development. You are, you are free to speak from there. I can bring your microphone or you can walk over to the podium, whichever you prefer. Honorable Ministers, uh, Honorable Okasai Opolot, Minister of State Energy, Honorable Peter Rokeris, the Minister of State for Minerals, the Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, our Your Excellency, the Norwegian Ambassador to Uganda, the honorable members of parliament who could be present, the chairpersons of the boards of the sector agencies present, the MDs representatives from our main ministries present. Also want to recognize the presence of the staff, the led by the several commissioners from Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development present, esteemed colleagues from the International Energy Agency, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Grace Tosime. I'm here to represent engineer Irene Patere, who has asked me to convey her apology. This function is very critical and important to her, but she's out of the country. 
she's been in Dodoma. There was a, a very urgent activity she had to participate in. That is the signing of the bilateral agreement. We do have a proposed project that is going on for natural gas pipeline. So there were a number of documents they needed to handle. She's unable to be here, but be assured that whatever we discuss here, I will ably give her a feedback. Members, I want to welcome you all to this important function. And you could see with the presence of two ministers and ministers, how important this function is to us. We do the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development is mandated to ensure reliable, adequate, and sustainable exploitation, management, and utilization of energy and mineral resources in Uganda. As you are all aware, the country is now implementing the third national development plan that is from 2020-2021 to 2024-2025, which recognizes the availability of sustainable, that is reliable, affordable, and clean energy services, that it is very critical for economic growth, poverty reduction, as well as the social and cultural transformation of our society. And hence, the objectives of NDP cannot be realized without sustainable energy supply. The NDP-3 sets several targets related to energy resource supply and realization, and these include the following among others. One, to increase proportion of the population with access to electricity from 24% in financial year 2018-2019 to 60% in 2025. Two, increase the share of the energy, of the clean energy used for cooking from 15% in financial year 2018-2019 to 50% in 2025. Thirdly, increase energy generation. Next, achieve fast oil production by 2025 through the development of the oil refinery and oil importation pipeline. And lastly, commercialization and value addition to the vast mineral resources, focusing on the five prioritized minerals, namely iron ore, phosphates, copper, cobalt, and aluminum. To realize the above objectives, it's important for the ministry to develop the necessary long-term planning tools and targets, which will guide the ministry and the sector on the sustainable energy development. The long-term energy planning will enable the ministry to develop policies, national targets, and investment strategies that are derived from the qualitative analysis of the sector scenarios, especially geared towards transition to a low carbon economy, aided by modeling of energy systems. Lack of a comprehensive energy plan that encompasses all energy sources, demand, supply, and roadmap to a sustainable future is a challenge to attain the stated goals. We have therefore developed a three-step strategy to achieve this program, namely the in-depth review report, which we are looking at today, to energy transition plan, and lastly, integrated energy resource master plan. The development of these plans will enable prioritization, de-risking investments, promoting innovative business models in the sector, and ensuring that the investments are optimized since these investments will utilize the necessary planning tools, including models to undertake analysis, projections, and real-time decision support. This will then result into accelerated and sustainable energy access, while at the same time providing reasonable return to investment to our partners. With the support of an incorporation with the International Energy Agency, we have undertaken an in-depth review of the energy sector in Uganda. This situation analysis is the first task of this broad 
task of long-term planning. Therefore, the in-depth review of this energy is informing the development of the energy transition plan and will further inform the development of the integrated resource plan. Therefore, the international the in-depth review in the depth review report will support Uganda as it works to chart its sustainable energy development path forward, achieve its goals to eradicate poverty, develop its energy resources, promote sustainable clean and nuclear energy, and bring prosperity to all Ugandans. I therefore take this opportunity to thank the IEA for their partnership, cooperation, and commitment, plus professionalism they have put in this task, which has enabled us to produce the first in-depth review, which we believe is the first of its kind, probably south of Sahara, and we want to believe it's the first of its kind. I also thank the Norwegian Embassy for the long cooperation and support to ensure that this important activity takes place by financially funding the IEA to undertake the IDR and also sponsoring this very event. I wish to thank the Tekken Co teams on both sides, the IEA team led by Madame Rebecca Ganghen and Madame Serene El Abed. Also want to recognize the effort put in by our team led by Dr. Vanaga, who is the overall task team leader for this project. The task force members are also appreciated and our key partners and stakeholders who have provided the much needed for this task. I really thank you for your patience, for your attention. And this is all said for God and my country. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are we still awake or somebody's already sleeping? We are still awake. Important ideas being discussed. I would like to recognize and salute our own, our own Ambassador Anne Christine from the Royal, the Royal Blessed Country of Norway. Am I right? You can wave to, the, to your people. We salute you because you know we love this country and we love what you are doing to help us to grow as a country and as a people. I want to welcome my brother, Dr. Gerard Wanaga, to give us an overview of a lot of work that has taken place behind the scenes to get us up to this moment. And then thereafter, I'll ask another person to add a bit of flavoring to the discussion before we can have a panel discussion. Uh, doctor, you're welcome. I salute all of you who have come in. I have not recognized you, especially members of the press, traditional media, and the new media. You wave, wave at us, and we salute you all. You're welcome. Um, thank you very much. The honorable ministers, uh, your excellencies, the um, the ambassador, the deputy executive director of the IEA, um, honorable members, parliament, the MDs, CEOs, the senior management of the ministry, uh, colleagues, uh, the task team members, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. My name is Gerard Banaga Bainji, and you will take it that I have been the task team leader for this assignment. And um, I'll pick it from where the PS uh, ended it and where the minister, the last time we were here, uh, the minister said he wanted results. So I have been playing hide and seek from the honorable ministers on this task. Uh, so, Honorable Kasai, um, I imagine your question is a bit answered. Thank you very much. Now, Honorable Ministers, um, we have been here a number of times, a number of times, 
um, what is the mission we are on? We reviewed every documentation about the sector, energy, oil, and minerals. And our ministry is blessed to have these three all integrated into one. Now, when you take a closer review of the consultancy reports, peer reviews, um, commentaries, there was one underlining statement that we need to improve on the planning and the coordination of these sectors. And so the decision was made that we have got to embark on this big assignment on how to improve uh, the planning and coordination. In one report, actually a harsh one, which was very harsh, said the sector lacks intra and ultra coordination and planning. So you will note that uh, there has been a, a review of some of the laws and this function of planning has properly been defined and vested in the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. So the broad purpose of this task we are on is really to improve that particular function of, of government and the stakeholders, as my peers has said. Now, you are looking at the three sectors. When we agreed, as the peers has said, we set out a three, a three step approach. And one was to do an in-depth review of the, these three segments. In-depth review, you don't plan from space. You must understand the starting point and where the status quo is, do analysis and make some particular recommendations. Now, that in-depth review, which as the peer said, um, is actually the first one south of Sahara. So it's a fact. Serene. Yes, and uh, for those who have been reading most of the energy references, we have this Global Energy Outlook, which is like a masterpiece from the IEA that all of us read. And you'll not find a report that you are going to launch today anywhere south of Sahara, apart from Uganda. Uganda will be the first one. And maybe the reason why the Deputy ED had to be here to see it herself. Um, now, we set up, we agreed on the a modus operandi. The first part was, of course, tough negotiations. With whom do you undertake the national planning function? I think that was the biggest question. And we wish to thank our ministers um, who had very serious discussions on this matter uh, together with the, um, the Norwegian embassy and arrived at the conclusion on the approach we should take because that was tough. It was too big for some of us technical officers, but the ministers handled that and agreed that we could take the format of partnering with the IEA as supported by the Royal Norwegian uh, government. So I wish to request the members that we clap for that discussion because the negotiations were not easy. Yes. The second one, we agreed that to undertake this assignment, it will be a partnership. We will not have a team coming here and do some work and it's gone. No, we will do it as all the assignments I have engaged myself in. We will do it with the Ugandan team as well as the IEA team. So the IEA put up their team or their teams because there is a team within the IEA, a team of professionals, but then they also have a team of reviewers from. Uh, various countries uh, i think they were the last time we were here ps you remember we had a delegation of about 20 people the first mission from the iea so these are reviewers who review every piece of work that all of us cherish when it finally comes out of the iea so they were also here then we got the ugandan team so i don't want to to pretend and take any credit or anything. So we had the Ugandan team, the task force. So I request the Ugandan team, or the 
yeah, because it was March first, everyone on the Ugandan team, those who have already arrived, you 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 stand up so that they see your results. Yes, uh, Mr. Kito is. We have a team of thirty-nine. As you can see, we are dealing with eh, with Mr. Mr. Kitoi, Dr. Brian. Did you raise your hand? Yes. So you see, we have uh, middle managers, senior managers. We made it sure that everybody is involved. Now we are dealing with energy, and when you talk about energy, as you see in the report, it is energy. It is renewable. It is efficiency. It is electricity. Um, Cecilia, you gave us a uh, engineer, Edward uh, Nsubga. Yes. So that's why I did not ask Cecilia to put up her hand because she nominated a very able person to represent her. So that's the, so we have 39. Then we have a team from Minros. Um, now you, you're wondering why we have two ministers. This report is covering energy, petroleum, and minerals. And the uh, Honorable Kelis has been at the ministry longer than most of us. And the uh, um, Honorable Minister wished to inform you that we have thoroughly analyzed petroleum and minerals. Where is the petroleum team which is here? I saw Pau, yes, Tony Cerebri, uh, Ochan. Um, we have minerals. Uh, minerals, who is from minerals? Yeah, Dr. Um, the doctor there, plus a group of uh, uh, team. These people have been moving around in all the industries, all the industries, all the factories to use, to assess, to determine their technologies and to project their future behaviors. I wish to thank you all uh, for that work. Um, so this is the first step in the long run to the long-term planning uh, for the sector. The in-depth review, International Energy Agency calls it the energy policy review. And let me tell you, we had issues with that naming because you see for us, we are much broad, but the IEA, that's the point we disagreed to agree that we let them call it what, but for us, the scope is covering the content that we wanted to cover. So we agreed that when the report comes out, they can always write the, energy policy review, and the content will be covering what we want it to cover. You know, sometimes you have to agree to disagree, but then move on. So, but we are glad that uh, that uh, took place. This, this in-depth review, this in-depth review has had several missions. And uh, the team on the IEA led by um, uh, Celine, uh, Ella Bed and uh, Madame Rebecca Gargan. So, Madame Bas, when you return, uh, please pass our thank you to Rebecca, Madame Rebecca. And I'm sure when you are still here, please thank Celine when she's still here. Celine is like a Minister of Foreign Affairs for the IEA, the pathfinder, struggling with all the cracks things. This team has brought here three missions three or four, but Serene has been here several times because the issues were more intense. Um, so we had the first mission, I think November, December. We had the second mission, Feb, the other mission in uh, March. And then we had the presentation of the draft and the validation in June. So in June, those who are here, uh, Honor Honorable Kasai has been at the beginning and at the end of this. We had a team of about 100 people here peer reviewing this report. So from all the segments uh, that are important for, the, for these sectors. This idea report is the input to the energy transition plan, which broadly defines the pathway for the country uh, for the next foreseeable future up to net zero time, which we are looking at 2065. And uh, have been, sometimes people think net zero means no emissions. No. Uh, please uh, just Google where you are, go to the IEA website. 
get the definition of net zero, then you know that there will be emissions at that time. Now, that is what is being covered under the energy transition plan, which fortunately we are also doing in partnership with the IEA. So the IDR as well as the energy transition plan is being undertaken in partnership with the International Energy Agency. And we have developed our capacity in the ministry and in the sector. We took a couple of people for training, for modeling, those in geospatial planning. We sent a team to uh, Italy. What's the city called? See, see what? Yes, whatever the name is. Tiesta? Yes. Because our understanding was we are not going to undertake work unless I believed we had the sufficient capacity to maintain that work and take it forward. And that will be the last time we'll be seeing the professionals from the other side, apart from peer reviewing and consultations. We made that condition to the IEA and the IEA believed in the same principles of building national capacities. So we have a team, um, even my colleague uh, Okitoi believes in this, that is the man, by the way, those who have read the National Development Plan, uh, this, uh, I don't know whether the old man or senior man, I don't know what it is. It was part of the core team. It was part of the team that developed the National Development Plan. So building national capacity is critical for us. And we thank um, IE for having supported us uh, along those lines. Now, this was, as I said, this was not possible unless we had the support of the Norwegian government. Uh, please, Madam uh, Ambassador, Your Excellency, when you return, please send a message to your predecessor uh, because she also asked for dinners, for lunches, luncheons. The reason was we had disagreements in negotiations and she was always there to break them. And together with our minister, uh, they managed to break us and bring us together and that's how we progressed. Please pass our sincere thanks uh, to her. After we finish these two, we are heading straight into the integrated resource plan. Now, this task is big for, is not big, but its nature does not meet the tenants of the IEA. You need uh, a different party. So that, even that we have concluded, we didn't want to start and stop halfway. Even that we have concluded, and that is being supported by the African Development Bank. What is the African Development Bank? Yes, the country. And the task team leader is Madame Stella uh, Madango. And uh, that has, go, has come out of a very intense discussions between the country director of African Development Bank with our peers and the president of the African Development Bank. So they have agreed to finance that integrated resource plan. At least to the core of the consultancy, which is quite expensive. And then the government of Uganda will support the other components uh, of, the, of the assignment. So in, um, I think uh, for the CEOs whom I was discussing with, and they are saying, where are you people? What are you doing? Where are you heading? You realize that the ministry at least has got a clear direction of where we are heading. And this is the beginning uh, of, that, of that journey. When we were in Paris at the IEA, um, Honorable Kasai questioned even the design of the reports, the strategies, and he said he wanted to look forward to the finalization of this assignment. So, Madame uh, Warwick, just the Honorable Kasai is the Honorable Minister next to you. He's our Minister in charge of energy. The next one is the Honorable Lokeris, is the Minister uh, responsible for minerals for the oil, the critical minerals which are necessary for the transition uh, is the guy. Yeah, we are happy to have very strong ministers that are grounded into the subject matter. Sometimes you wonder whether they are politicians or technical officers, but they are senior and experienced, so they give us very good guidance. This is the direction, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking in terms of enhancing the integrated resource planning for energy, for oil, for minerals. And 
this is the first step that will be launched uh, today. With that, I hope I put the subject into context uh, for everybody to appreciate. For those who have not been with us in the last one, one year or so, thank you very much. Thank you. It is evident that there is a relationship between access to renewable energy and development. There is also a relationship, I would say direct relationship between energy per capita and GDP. There is also a relationship between access and affordability. Affordability is one of the major, major challenges uh, that many countries in Africa face because whereas they have energy sources, uh, to a large extent, most of the populations are not able to gain from the energies that the country produces because of cost. And developing a way in which we get the balance just right is important if we are to take this country forward. And personally, I identify with the cause of today's session. I invite my sister, Serene, to come and unveil her package to all of us. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, colleagues. Um, it's always a bit challenging to take the floor after Gerald now that we have been interacting for a few times uh, over the re recent months. Uh, my name is Serena Abed, and I'm Africa Program Officer at the International Energy Agency. I'm very, very pleased and honored uh, by your presence, all of you here today. Uh, you've been so much engaged. Many of you have taken uh, part in the development of this project. And um, today it's just uh, amazing to see also this commitment ongoing to see the results of our joint effort in developing this report. It's also, of course, my great honor to have such an esteemed uh, guest here with uh, Honorable Minister Okasai that we had the opportunity to discuss and he challenged us also in the past on uh, the results and the, the project. Also with uh, Honorable Lokeris, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Norway, and uh, of course, our Deputy Executive Director, Mary Vorlik, who is uh, here today for the first time in Uganda. And indeed, she insisted to come to uh, attend this launch, uh, even though she had really long trip uh, to launch other key reports in different regions in the world. So thanks again. Um, today, I will be giving a short presentation. I hope it will not be boring, but uh, try to capture uh, really the main uh, takeaways from our reports. Um, this uh, report, of course, as you now understand, has been developed jointly with the Ministry of Energy and uh, with uh, many of you, of course. And uh, we hope this way it is really comprehensive and uh, it captures different perspectives on the whole energy sector in Uganda. So Uganda now is in a turning point in terms of its development agenda and our analysis and findings in this report aim to describe the current energy context, its opportunities, but also to provide a number of recommendations based on uh, the long experience of the IEA working also with different countries around the world. And uh, my colleague Gerald just uh, uh, mentioned that our work also benefited from inputs from uh, representatives from uh, other countries uh, who joined the uh, mission to give insights also and uh, to, to take part in the discussion. The findings and the uh, assessments, as well as the recommendations have been discussed with the ministry several times. And we see that already, given that the ministry is embarking, embarking in this uh, very commendable project of developing the energy transition plan and the integrated energy resource master plan, some of the recommendations that we uh, um, provided a few months ago are already being implemented. So um, next slide. While well, we aim here with this uh, first slide to be to give a bit of the context and overview, quick overview of uh, the energy context. So as we said, the report provides a comprehensive overview of Uganda energy sector, and we looked at uh, ten different focus areas when uh, um, 
uh, developing this report that were identified and defined jointly with the ministry, of course, to align with the, with the country's priorities. These go from the uh, power sector, renewable energy, access to electricity, cooking, oil and gas, uh, critical minerals, um, efficiency, investment, environment, and climate. Uganda is a country that has a very dynamic, young, and increasingly urban population. It has also considerable, uh, considerable amount of natural resources, including fertile soils, petroleum deposits, and uh, reserves of iron ore, copper, cobalt, all of which are really key to ensure uh, energy development in the country. Its economy is set to grow fast, and uh, so is its demand for energy. Uganda has also the technical expertise and the government institutions necessary to advance its energy policy goals. Key policy reforms, such as also the um, recently updated uh, policy, uh, Uganda policy, uh, energy policy, demonstrate the country's commitment uh, to achieve its ambitious uh, objectives in terms of uh, energy and the more broadly development. And also, Uganda is a leader, a regional leader, in, in terms of energy statistics. And important efforts and data and statistics over the last years has led to improved coverage, quality, and timeliness of energy balances and related data. However, despite all these uh, great achievements, uh, there are a few challenges uh, that are, uh, need to be urgently addressed uh, to foster socioeconomic development. These include low electrification rates and uh, low access rates to clean cooking solutions, uh, an energy infrastructure that could be further enhanced, and a high reliance of the power sector on hydropower. So with having provided this very high level overview of Uganda's energy sector uh, and the, the few challenges it faces, we can now go into more of the uh, details of each um, section uh, we uh, consider it. And starting with the power sector, including the renewable energy, used for power generation. So first and foremost, the government of Uganda is really to be commended for its efforts in substantially increasing uh, its generating capacity, as we see from this graph of between 2002 and 2023, the increase was uh, fourfold. Uh, it went from uh, 100, 320 megawatts in 2022 to over 1,346 megawatt at the beginning of 2023. And today, Uganda has a significant surplus related to its peak uh, demand of about 800 megawatt. The Karuma hydroelectric power plant coming fully online in 2023 will add a further 600 megawatt, which will give a total of almost 2,000 megawatt. The government is also to be commended for promoting renewable energy and power generation. Currently, almost all power in Uganda is generated from renewables, with over 80% coming from hydropower. And uh, the remaining also comes from other types of renewables, including uh, several solar photovoltaic installations and thermal power plants that burn sugarcane by gas. So, however, the, the significant reliance on one of um, type of generation, which is uh, hydropower, has implications for energy security, especially in the context of uh, climate change and the vulnerability of the region and the country, in particular to climate change impacts, which of course has consequences on the availability of water resources. And uh, further, when it comes to other types of renewables that allow uh, uh, power generation, uh, which are mainly solar systems, standards for these solutions exist, but are reportedly rarely enforced. And this is, we understand that it's um, mainly due to some limitation in capacities of uh, the Ugandan Bureau of Standards, uh, particularly outside of Kampala. Almost all solar systems and components are important. And the National Bureau of Standards also sometimes relies on uh, third parties to run testings of products these are uh, located outside of the country, which really makes also more challenging uh, the control of counterfeit products. On the other hand, the rapid increase in power generation has not been sufficiently coordinated with investment and in transmission and distribution. As a result, as we have ju just saw, there is um, uh, a significant amount of power that is generated, but is not used. Uh, this has added and uh, significantly to the cost of um, power, 
as the government had to pay also for GMET uh, power that has not been able to use. But it's important to note that now the government has decided with IPPs to remove the clause of uh, pay or take, which uh, um, which uh, uh, requires the government to use this uh, energy that is not used. So these high tariffs, of course, have been a barrier to electricity consumption for many consumers. Um, for, for them, even those who have access, the cost has discouraged users, uh, creating additional challenges in terms of grid extension and meeting operation and maintenance expenses. And um, part of the response of the government to these challenges, um, he has recently decided to remerge the ut three utilities, the one on uh, generation, uh, transmission and distribution into a one a vertically integrated Uganda national electricity company. So in light of this context, if we move to the recommendations, uh, we've uh, put uh, a number of these. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, we recommended in uh, our analysis for the government to uh, as strengthening and enforcing quality standards for renewable energy systems, notably standalone solar PV, with in-country testing whenever it is possible, and also supported by public awareness campaigns. Also, prioritize addressing the transmission issue and boosting product productive use of energy and maximizing existing generation for grid stability, cost reduction, and potential customer expansion. Uh, thirdly, we, continued, uh, we encourage continued consultation also with other stakeholders uh, in the power sector reforms and providing additional clarity on the plans. This is something that uh, we've been hearing uh, quite a number of times uh, when uh, performing the, the interviews with different stakeholders. Um, they had some uncertainties also on the, 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 the near-term future um, that will be impacted by the uh, sector reforms. And finally, we also uh, propose to further develop inter interconnections and power trade between uh, the neighboring countries to take advantage of this excess of uh, power. These are only a few recommendations. Of course, in the report, um, you have more context in the, in the additional ones also to consider. Linked to the power sector, we move to access uh, to electricity. And here again, um, if you see the graph, uh, we see that over the years, Uganda has made steady progress in increasing access to electricity. And currently around 30% of the population has access, up from barely 15% in, uh, in 2010. So uh, doubling in just uh, a, de a decade. However, also it's important to note that uh, there are disparities of access to electricity between rural and urban areas. Uh, only one in seven has access in rural areas where in urban areas, the access rate is uh, 80%. While most uh, households with access to electricity have been connected to the national power grid, off-grid solutions have gained a significant role, especially in the past five years. And this also mainly for rural households who predominantly rely on non-grid solutions like solar mountains, rechargeable flashlights, and solar home systems but also sometimes unclean sources of energies like kerosene and uh, candles. And this joins uh, the, the point that was raised in the power sector discussion earlier, with the need to really enhance standards for these uh, uh, solar products. Uh, the government and its development partner have pursued several policies and programs to enhance electrification by addressing crucial issues such as grid connections and rural electrification. And private distributions also have played a significant role, selling around uh, 300,000 off-grid electricity system annually since 2018. The government provides uh, a number of benefits uh, for private companies, such as uh, favorable tax regimes and regulations, like VAT exemptions or import duty waivers on solar PV panels and batteries. However, also from what we understood from our discussions, many of these measures are widely perceived uh, as uneven and inconsistent uh, sometimes. Also, refunds uh, for them take uh, sometimes uh, a long time. Affordability, as raised um, earlier by Madam PS, is also a big challenge as households are financially constrained, both for getting uh, the connection to a source of power, but then also to acquire an appliance in, 
and uh, finally to consume electricity once connected. And uh, as raised earlier, the situation hampers the profitability of electrification projects and significantly reduces the interest of private investors, especially in rural and remote areas. So moving to also a, a, a small set of recommendations um, that we proposed. We, uh, we proposed that to address these issues, the government could consider enhancing policies uh, for fair market conditions for the private sector, covering customs tax regimes, enforcement of quality standards, etc., and collaborating with financial partners to design schemes that enable private sector providers and off-grid companies to offer affordable electricity through sustainable and scalable business models. Now moving to uh, another urgent, even more urgent issue to address, which is access to clean cooking uh, in Uganda, but also uh, this is um, a, a topic of uh, high priority in the whole region in Sub-Saharan Africa. But looking at Uganda, Uganda has uh, here again made substantial progress over the recent years in terms of providing access to clean cooking solutions. However, current access rates remain low um, according to our data, these are uh, standing um, to around 6%. We see in one of the graphs, the one on the right, that uh, there are some rather concerning statistics, as we see around 95% of households in Uganda uh, rely on either wood or charcoal as their primary energy source for cooking. And there are several, several challenges that stand in the way of improving access to cooking. Affordability here again, as for power sector, remain the, remains the main concern. Improved cook stoves and alternative fuels are more expensive than biomass, which is, uh, when collected, is often perceived as uh, being free. This, along with the lack of financing options for stove distributors and potential customers, as well as insuff insufficient distribution uh, of infrastructure for LPG. Uh, another point that also comes out is uh, the lack, the um, cultural and uh, behavioral issues, as um, these can be barriers to improving access. Because when ev even when households adopt clean cooking technology, they do often uh, this incompletely. The government, uh, to tackle this, has implemented several instruments and mechanisms. For instance, to lower the cost, uh, e-cooking tariffs for electricity cooking is available to all grid-connected customers. But the low connection rates makes the option unavailable to most um, of the households. The government is also promoting the use of LPG, including through the distribution of free startup kits, including free cylinders, and the construction of filling stations outside of Kampala, as well as a standardization of LPG cylinders. So improved cook stoves relying on biomass as fuel will continue to be used with the country transitions to modern cooking solutions. Therefore, it is important to ensure sustainability uh, of biomass use for both upstreams and downstream processes. We see also a need to make sure that the national clean uh, strategy, the government is very commendable for the development of such, uh, such a strategy, there is a need uh, that this strategy includes plans for sustainable use of biomass, but also other clean cooking solutions, and backed by tools like technical assistance and financial incentives to encourage the uptake of uh, these uh, solutions. Um, the next uh, area we will be looking at is the oil and gas sector. Um, Oil accounted for uh, less than 10% of Uganda's total energy supply in 2020, and this oil was primarily used for uh, road transport. The country's first two domestic oil development projects, Tilenga and Kingfishers, are expected to begin production in 2025, and the development of a refinery, a refinery to be located in Kabali Hoime district has long been a goal uh, of the government. A consortium that includes the main upstream developers, Total Energy, Sinoc uh, of China, UNOC, uh, the Uganda National Oil Company, and the Tanzanian Petroleum Development Corporation is planning to build a crude oil pipeline to the port of Tanga in Tanzania. So these are mainly the, the pro oil projects uh, Uganda is uh, currently um, developing. So as a landlocked uh, country, Uganda faces the challenge of energy security 
as uh, it needs to import via third countries. And uh, currently, um, it's about 80% coming through Kenya and the rest via Tanzania. And both the East Africa crude oil pipeline and the refinery could contribute to Uganda's energy mix and security, reducing then reliance on imported oil products. Oil stocks also, uh, um, if well managed, can play an important role in energy security. Uh, and there is also a name to have output of uh, LPG from the two oil production sites, which is expected to be three kilo, kilo barrels a day. This can provide LPG to the domestic market and also importantly contribute to uh, access to clean cooking solutions, uh, playing uh, therefore an important role in helping Uganda transition from the use of biomass to clean cooking solutions. And uh, further to these oil production sites, the government is also planning for significant output from the refinery. All tax and non-tax revenues of, uh, for the government from oil are received by the Uganda Revenue Authority and de deposited in the petroleum fund, um, designed to ensure that the revenues from petroleum resources are well managed and allocated for the benefits of current and future generations, as well as for the development of infrastructure in the country. Now, uh, as uh, the government of Uganda develop its oil projects, uh, our, consider, uh, our recommendation would be for the government to consider the following. Um, the, this one is uh, almost um, the first recommendation on uh, making sure that oil projects are consistent with the energy transition plan of Uganda is of course something that the government is uh, currently working on very closely. Uh, also, there is a need of course, uh, to continue complying with environment and social requirements, uh, given the, the uh, impact of the, these uh, projects. Second, while upstream projects can play a significant role in a, a country's economic and social development, it's important to ensure that all revenues are well managed. managed. And with the petroleum fund we've um, just raised as an initiative uh, by the government, um, we, uh, uh, of course, highly recommend this will uh, this continues uh, to be um, the case and that the petroleum fund continues to be well managed and monitored. Um, third, the government could consider developing a policy for maintaining and managing oil stocks to strengthen oil uh, supply of um, oil security. Um, and then uh, it's important also to note that um, as the world transitions successfully to um, zero emissions by 20, 50 all other clean projects uh, uh, energy projects need to be developed but this is again something that the government is working on currently with the energy transition plan and it will be the main focus also of the integrated energy resource master plan to define the really the the, the projects that will uh, in the end um, lead to the uh, attainment of the uh, uh, energy development in the country um critical minerals now um so after decades of uh, stagnation and mining activities in Uganda, uh, renewed initial exploration began in, 20, in uh, 2000 and has now recovered. Uganda has discovered deposits of miner minerals that are critical for the worldwide transition to cleaner energy systems, including copper, cobalt, graphite, and rare earth elements. However, there is currently no production of critical minerals in Uganda. Um, the production is uh, in includes today limestone, pozzolona, and vermiculite, along with a small amount of uh, gold. New policies and legislation have been introduced. These include, for example, the Mining and Minerals Act of 2022, the Mining and Minerals Policy for Uganda 2018, just to cite a few, as well as uh, national policies such as the Vision 2040, of course, and the National Development Plan 3. Um, there is still limited investment also in large-scale mineral production. And um, it's important to maintain uh, an efficient transport infrastructure to connecting Uganda with international markets when it comes to also uh, exporting the um, minerals uh, to, to uh, other parts in the world, especially since the country is landlocked. A stable power supply is also important since the mining industry is highly energy intensive. Uh, the production of critical minerals generally requires significant, um, significantly more energy than uh, that of 
metals such as iron, since the ore for critical minerals is usually less concentrated. This means that the production also has a um, uh, high number uh, of emissions of uh, GHG emissions. And many mining companies driven by investors needs and consumers to consume uh, low impact uh, products aim to cut their emissions uh, from mineral production. And um, this comes of course from electricity and fuel consumption. For refined copper production, uh, just to give some examples, switching to renewable energy can reduce carbon intensity by two thirds while using electricity over fossil fuels can achieve an 80% reduction according to some other IEA analysis. Uganda has, as we saw uh, earlier, abandoned uh, hydropower resources and renewable energy that could help make the country a relatively low carbon source of critical minerals. Uh, and the mining sector may be able to learn lessons also from the investment experience of the countries and the petroleum sector. This includes the development of sector legislation, local capacity building, and the creation and management of a national resource company. Some of our key recommendations we suggest here in the mining um, and the critical minerals is um, to leading initiatives to attract investments in mineral production with a priority to critical minerals that are essential for the country and the global transition to renewable energies. Uh, developing also a roadmap for infrastructure development, such as railway extensions, so that investors can better plan the development of resources in anticipation of demand. And of course, this is something again that will be part of the integrated energy resource master plan. And finally, evaluating the energy requirements of mining operations by improving data collection and investing, investigating possibilities for providing low carbon power for mineral processing. And now coming to another topic that is of high priority worldwide and uh, uh, of course uh, in Uganda, which is energy efficiency. Again, starting from a, a few uh, data, we see that energy intensity in Uganda has declined by 35% over the last two decades. But despite this uh, progress, the country still has a relatively high intensity compared to other countries in uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa region uh, such as uh, Senegal, for instance, and Morocco uh, in Africa. A significant contribution to this is the heavy reliance on biomass for cooking in the residential and building sector, which uh, dominates the energy consumption. But efforts are underway to establish uh, Uganda first legal regulatory and enforcement framework for energy efficiency following the adoption of the 2023 national energy policy. Um, the absence of such a legal framework has previously hindered several measures, such as the development and enforcement of new buildings, and also the establishment of uh, labeling uh, and the enforcement of the minimum energy performance standards. Uganda also faces a challenge in its, uh, uh, in its aging uh, vehicle fleet, which has implications for the environment uh, and the CO2 emissions in, uh, in Uganda. Uh, primarily generated from fuel combust combustions, mostly from the transport sector. While if we look at electricity, given the fact that it's of course um, almost all renewables, it's only account for 1% of emissions in Uganda. Looking at uh, recommendations here, we see that incentives and dedicated funding instruments, such as grants, uh, preferential loans, and tax incentives for the purchase of energy efficient equipment uh, by end users can leverage the potential of energy efficiency and should be an area of focus. Also, digitalization can play a role in improving efficiency in various sectors and avoiding losses uh, could be further developed also in Uganda. And also, of course, there are uh, many advantages of fostering the growth of e-mobility starting from the two and three wheelers. Um, we're almost there. Um, now we've, we're gonna look at the energy climate change and the environment in uh, Uganda. And um, Uganda's energy sector has a significant environment impact, uh, including and mainly on deforestation and biodiversity loss, uh, giving the uh, huge amount of uh, biomass used. So the, the um, 
Air pollution is also a concern, as uh, just uh, seen, due to widespread use of uh, biomass, but also the aging uh, fleet of vehicles. The government has taken steps to mitigate deforestation, particularly by promoting clean cooking access through much remain to be done, given the population's continued high dependence on um, biomass. The government is also considering the future impact of extractive operations on land, water, and air pollution, as well as adaptation measures in the sector, uh, particularly related to the vulnerability to climate change of the country's large hydropower generating capacities. Also, Uganda is looking at the potential of waste to energy approaches, which has the potential of reducing unsustainable biomass consumption. Um, further to the recommendations related to the sustainable use of biomass and the promotion of clean cooking solutions we've just seen previously, the government, um, in our point of view, could also consider enforcing strict environment, uh, environmental assessments, monitoring and reporting for oil and gas mining projects, um, and also, the government could develop further initiatives in circular economy, particularly those aimed at using sustainable types of waste as an energy source. And now, last but not least, another key topic, uh, key areas that has been also a focus for this particular report, but more broadly at the IEA as we continue to develop our work in, um, in Africa, the, the, the issue of uh, investments, how to make these uh, all aspirations um, possible. Um, Uganda has created a solid investment environment to both international and private investors and has proved successful in attracting investment to the oil and gas and the power generation sector to meet it, uh, its growing energy demands. As we see from this graph, FDI to Uganda has been above the average for East and Southern Africa, reaching nearly 3% of GDP between 2017 and 2021. This is hugely attributed to reforms, including the creation of the Uganda Investment Authority. However, we see also that compared to the region, the rebound after the COVID crisis has been slow. And this is mainly due to the fact that Uganda's investment are mainly commodity-based, essentially oil. And uh, we are aware of the also the slow uh, down in, the, in, the, in terms of investment decisions in the oil sector. Two major challenges lie ahead. First, planning and standardization. As there is a vital need to run detailed energy sector development plans with the objective to identify which sectors and which projects should be the priority and also which players should be involved in there. And here again, look at how to mobilize the private sector. Of course, again, this will be further um, tackled and enhanced as the government is uh, working on developing its uh, energy uh, integrated energy resource master plan. And the second one is, um, is uh, also true for the whole uh, continent, the issue of accessing affordable capital. The cap cost of capital in Uganda is, um, remains one of the major challenges across the energy sector. And these costs being passed through to consumers via the tariff. Reducing these tariffs will then rely on attracting cheaper capital across the electricity system. And these challenges um, to attract appropriate and affordable capital are particularly exacerbated for the local developers. So in order to tackle the uh, just mentioned challenges, we put forward the uh, few recommendations. The need again to enhance planning and, and if identifying key projects for um, private, no, for partner, <coughs> private uh, public partnerships, sorry as the most uh, appropriate source of capital. And the integrated energy resource master plan will help again achieving this. Attracting domestic capital is key, in particular for local development. Uh, this needs to come with huge amounts of capacity buildings also on business models for the local banks, for them to understand also how uh, the objectives of the uh, local startups, local entrepreneurs, and the local businesses. Uh, also, of course, collaborating with partners to cut capital costs, ensuring domestic financiers play a role in designing blended finance instruments, especially those with grant equity and debt elements in multiple stages. And finally, as mentioned in the power sector uh, section, keeping the investment on transmission and distribution on top of the priorities, as well as uh, driving in further investments. Uh, with this, I will stop here.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Geir uh, Hangelsen, I'm with the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. And you may notice that I have uh, the same uh, surname as the ambassador. And uh, this is the uh, um, main occasion I'm here. I'm fortunate to be back in Uganda after 17 years. Uh, I work here, not at the embassy. I don't work with the Norwegian energy portfolio. Uh, I work home office for NORAD and uh, I report to NORAD and is by no means under the instruction of Her Excellency. Hi everyone, uh, Stella Mandago with African Development Bank. Um, I work in the energy sector with the African Development Bank. Um, I've been working in different countries overseeing the energy portfolio, uh, ranging from investment issues, uh, policy issues, and knowledge work more or less. So I'm happy to be in Uganda. I've been working with uh, Dr. Gerald and his team. Um, so, yep, that's me. Thanks. Yeah, um, once again, Gerard Banaga, Bainji. Um, I've not been around for quite a long time, maybe 24 years. Yeah, I worked in the first in the downstream, midstream, uh, petroleum upstream. I've worked with the minerals. I've worked with the energy in the last uh, eight or so years. Yes, and I'm the task team leader for the assignment. Thank you. Yeah, James Barnaby, with about 27 years of experience in the energy sector. I used to work for the ministry, as many of you know. Currently a consultant with Modern Energy Cooking Services. This is a UK funded project that's promoting cooking with electricity. During the break, those are the questions people are asking me. How do we manage to cook with electricity? I'm, I'm the champion for that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Serena Nabed, Africa Program Officer. I'm um, mainly in charge of the uh, Eastern the Central Africa. And uh, while well, I have the hard uh, duty to speak for many colleagues who worked on uh, this uh, project uh, from uh, across uh, the sectors, uh, again, thank you uh, for being here and I'm happy to be part of this panel again. So let me start with you. Um, let me start with, with you, Serene. You, you're from the Norwegian Embassy. They've found it important to invest resources into developing. Um, yeah, sorry. developing this uh, the idea and we want to understand we've had it is the first in the sub, sub, sub saharan africa we want to understand why is it so important and why have the rest of the you know has the rest of the continent not taken it so so seriously why are we the first? Just put it in context briefly. Thank you. Yeah. And let me briefly explain. I, I was invited my uh, good colleague, Samuel Kajuba, at the Norwegian Embassy to, to step in um, for this panel discussion. And uh, it was with the argument that NORAD represents the future. And uh, as uh, I think most of you are aware of, the Embassy has decided to closed down uh, here in Uganda uh, by, by the end of uh, July, uh, which is um, a very unfortunate and not easy to understand decision, but, but that's, that, 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 is the, that is the prerogative of our um, politicians. Um, uh, but we have a marching order. Um, we have a quite uh, significant engagement here in uh, Uganda. And uh, the marching order from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is to continue um, that engagement. And energy is uh, among the priority sector for our future cooperation with Uganda. Um, and uh, I think that will be followed up um, um, 
by uh, NORAD, Oslo headquarters, as well as uh, the uh, Norwegian embassy in, in Dar es Salaam. Now we, NORAD, uh, Norway, uh, supported the uh, um, independent uh, review. And this is part of a broader engagement we have with uh, uh, our good colleagues in IEA. Uh, we were also uh, contributing funding for the Africa Outlook Net Zero uh, 2022 report. Um, and in response to your question, why are not all the African countries engaging? Uh, IEA will, uh, as part of this cooperation, also be engaging with Mozambique on a similar policy policy review. So um, colleagues in Africa are coming on board on, on this. And I think overall it's very good to see um, IEA engaging more actively in, in Africa. I think they've really um, made a stance on, on clean cooking as a as a topic, uh, and uh, the work they're doing on, on finance and governance is also very appropriate for, for the sector. And as you all are aware, they are already in uh, flight mood on the energy transition um, um, for, for Uganda to present, be presented at, uh, at, the, at the COP. Um, so, but why do we do this? Uh, I think we are uh, in agreement. Uh, this is a need for fact-based decision-making. And uh, I think uh, we all appreciate uh, IEA's capacity to analyze and compare and provide feedback on political uh, priorities and also um, explain what will be the outcome of, of uh, some decisions. So, I, can I continue a little bit just to reflect on the recommendations in, in the report? Or? In another two minutes. Oh yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I really wanted to uh, go into some of the key recommendations, but but I think um, just to confirm. Um, <coughs> Uh, how we see this as important and, and relevant. I, I wanted to just briefly reflect back on what has happened here in, in Uganda over the last 25 to, to 20 years. Um, and it's, it's been a very significant uh, development uh, with uh, establishing, uh, establishing the uh, institutional framework, um, the regulator, the unbundling of the Uganda Electricity Board. Uh, when I last worked here, you had a very uh, tough power crisis. That was in the period 2003 to six. I worked very hard, but when I left uh, still, it was um, to be worse be before it uh, became better. Uh, at that time, we uh, did support the uh, um, um, investment in the Navamba heavy fuel oil um, um, generation uh, facility, and that seemed very relevant and, and uh, a good move uh, move compared to the very costly hired Agreco diesel generators that you had to to use at that time. And uh, we had action on other fields. We uh, had the um, institutional cooperation between uh, the Norwegian Water Resources and the Energy Directorate and the regulator. Um, we had, uh, we started the twinning uh, program between UTCL and, and Stotnet. And uh, we started uh, also that period, the oil for development program. Um, and we started uh, what I hope is still a very active group um, the energy sector working group as a platform for coordination between development partners. Now, looking back, it's, it's very obvious that um, you have moved from a poverty deficit to a very large surplus. And, and, and the challenge now is to make uh, good use of that surplus. You're also about to become an oil exporter. And uh, much of what is needed in terms of the institutional regulatory framework is in, uh, in place. And I think one other, um, some, some, some other changes that I notice is that 
there are much many more development partners around the table. There's been a proliferation in, in energy programs, and it's a very much clearer focus on, on, on this mobilization of commercial in, in investments. And I think uh, the recommend the you, you are now, I think you are setting a record now because you have um, almost as you publish your new uh, national energy policy, the 2023 energy policy, um, almost the same time, uh, simultaneously, you publish a review of, of that policy. Um, and uh, it's confirming, I think, uh, much many of the of, of the of the um, of the political priorities you you have uh, opted for. Uh, key challenges for me, my take on this is uh, electricity and cooking access rates. So I think that's that's a very important topic, and also productive use of electricity. Um, the energy transition for me is mostly about um, um, transitioning from biomass. I think that's that's the key one for, for Uganda. Now, the three recommendations uh, I wanted to hone in on is the one on energy planning. And I'm, I'm very glad to see that you are already in, in action, following up on, on, uh, on the integrated energy resource plan. Um, my sort of humble uh, input to that um, part of, of, of the continued process would be it's important that this is aligned with regional planning. And uh, so, so you don't end up with different priorities at national and, and regional level. Uh, and uh, EIPP will be a huge opportunity for energy security and also offset of your significant power resources. Uh, planning needs to be realistic. And this means that it, it, it can't be a wish list, a political wish list of what you want to achieve. It must be based on, on, on uh, reality because uh, if it's not uh, realistic, then it will not be able to inform investment decisions. And then, um, uh, GIS based, that's music in my ears, uh, so you, you get a combination of, of where the energy loads are, where the infrastructure might go uh, on a geographical basis, and this is very useful input, not only to delineate where the grid will extend, but also very important uh, clarification for the private sector on in what areas they should be engaging. And I think we have some interesting experience on that from both Tanzania and, and Mozambique that we could share with share with you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll be getting back to you. Uh, I wanted uh, Sirin to come in here because IEA. How did you end up in Uganda? And we needed to understand is this subject still uninteresting to the majority of African countries? Energy planning, just put, put it in context, then we'll go on with the discussion. Hello, oh yes, great. Um, yes, so I, um, well, the uh, Africa program within the agency uh, keeps growing uh, really uh, a, a lot, and uh, we keep uh, engaging with uh, several countries. Uh, we've been working already since decades, of course, as you all know now, the IEA is the authoritative agency to provide energy data, and we've been working since decades with partners, um, including in Africa, to collect uh, energy uh, access data. But uh, also since uh, recent years, we've been engaging more and more uh, with individual countries because, of course, we all know that uh, if we want to move in the uh, energy development, this is a worldwide issue and we need to be uh, working with all partners around the world. And um, now uh, we've, had, we've had this um, great interactions at the highest level. Um, our deputy also had uh, uh, several interactions with the minister and uh, they exchanged on the priorities of uh, Uganda and how the IEA also can contribute. And this uh, led us to um, 
define a, a work plan, starting with this in-depth energy policy review that, uh, just to note, this is something the IEA has been doing since its creation in uh, 1974 for its member countries um, every five years, uh, because this uh, goes uh, with uh, the, the idea of having uh, like-mindedness between uh, member countries, and it has proven to be a really efficient tool also to uh, encourage peer, peer learning. And the IA again, is uh, beyond giving access to data, and the comprehensive data is also a platform for a global energy dialogue. Um, so we thought that also other partner countries, key partner countries, uh, we could, could uh, engage with them in this type of projects. And uh, this is the case for Uganda this year. Um, where again, as mentioned, we've involved uh, um, experts from uh, France, from Norway, uh, from Italy, from Portugal, uh, from the US also who joined this uh, mission and uh, shared insights also from practices that uh, they have in their own countries. Um, speaking about other um, uh, Afri uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, we are also um, launching the same um, project. Of course, it's always design it to the local context so you won't see the same uh, structure as for another country we've defined the priorities for uganda together with the ministry of uganda and now we are about to launch another report with senegal uh, again this has been done in a uh, close collaboration with the ministry and we keep engaging again thanks to uh, the support also of norad for uh, mozambique uh, we will be doing also this uh, project with Kenya and more are to come. And uh, as we also continue to develop this uh, great bilateral uh, work relationship with uh, African countries. I'll uh, stop here. I spoke too much already. <laughs> I would like to Thank you so much. We'll come to Stella. We need to, to understand the role of development partners, especially in terms of leveraging the knowledge from idea to better support government efforts towards clean energy. Um, I think, uh, let me start from the African Development Bank perspective first. Um, African Development Bank has five key strategic uh, initiatives or areas that we really focus on. And before I go there, let me acknowledge the work of IEA. First, we work with IEA. We do appreciate your level and quality of data. So thank you. and. Is happy to know that we are taking an assignment from, from where you, you, you've been working. Yeah. Okay, so let me go back. We have five key areas. We have Light Up and Power Africa. There is Integrate Africa, Transform Quality of Lives of Africa, Industrialize and Feed Africa. So if you look into all those five, the backbone is Light Up and Power Africa. If you don't have light, you don't have power, you cannot industrialize, you cannot do anything almost. So there is so much stake at just that one pillar to be able to hold the four pillars, right? So if you look into just that one pillar of uh, Light Up and Power Africa, which is, is a common thread of our discussion here today, we are looking into the whole energy spectrum. And this is where we come also in partnership with other development partners at looking at all sorts of energy that will be able to reach the, if it's a country goal or Africa goal, let's say millennium, whatever goal that um, specific country wants to achieve. So the partnership is key in this aspect. Uh, taking an example, drawing the lessons from the recommendations from today, looking into clean energy, critical mineral resources, everything that needs to be able to put that, uh, to move that needle a step further into the energy sector. This idea is going to be critical as it's an underpinning framework into all the work we do. This, what is saying to all development partners, the government has a clear direction and vision. They know where they are going in terms of the energy sector. So for us, it's much easier to align and coordinate our financing and any other level of support to be able to move in together with the government. So this is our role and our role has become more easier in this context because the government has sent a clear message on where they want to go in terms of uh, energy sector. They want to look into all energy sources that are going to be able to move that needle to make sure there is that uh, access for yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Now over to Dr. Banaga. Uh, in April this year, the cabinet approved 
the new energy policy for this country. There are tar targets that have been set in that policy. So we would like you to help us understand how the idea, how this review is going to help the government of Uganda achieve its targets in the energy policy. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I have already spoken too much, so I try to limit. You see, in 2008 or seven, I read a report by one of the consultants which said the government of Uganda wishes plans on oil were wishful thinking. So after that, I walked to the Royal Norwegian Embassy. I said, how can you support a country that has wishful thinking? They gave us $3.5 million. We undertook a comprehensive assessment of the oil industry. And by 2010, we had the bankable results that have shaped the progress of the oil industry. What it is, is that if you check our colleague from NORAD, we want to ensure that the policies, the targets are informed by critical thinking and critical analysis. The energy policy has already given us targets. Our task is to design a framework that attains those targets. Um, the energy, minerals, oil is a capital intensive sector with long gestation period. All investments have got to be justified. They have got to be verifiable. And your analysis and approach has got to be beyond the reproach of many investors. Nobody will put a million dollar. You know, we're talking of $20 billion, $100 million. Just check the projects in the energy sector. It's, 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 quite, it's quite heavy. And therefore, how we inform these investments, how we inform our targets, how we inform our policies is critical. So we are developing a quantitative and objective basis towards realizing the targets, be it targets of energy access, be it targets of productive use of energy, be targets of clean cooking, be targets, I think I've talked about universal access, we have 2030 as a target, universal, be it targets on the improvision and incorporation of the critical minerals towards energy transition, be it targets in green mobility, which is a big factor now, um, we need this basis that is strong, robust, and livable, and livable that we can use to promote and also to engage with our possible investment and partners, and also to benefit all the stakeholders in the sector. And so these plans are aimed at realizing those objectives that we recently received under the energy policy. Thank you, Dr. Banaga. Now let's get the perspective of the private sector uh, so, Mr. Banabe, with your experience, with your knowledge of the sector, what opportunities uh, do we have as a country in regard to moving towards clean energy? Just talk to us, Roda. Yeah, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, we all recognize that without increased access, we cannot develop, and therefore, we, it's a challenge we must meet so that we can increase our access levels. You saw in the figures that, um, okay, in the rural, it's only 20% that have access to electricity. In the urban, it's about 80. But at the same time, we are a very rich country. We, we've got a lot of resources, as you saw, a lot of renewables, We've got plentiful sunshine. We've got extra generation capacity that's coming in. And therefore, we have an opportunity to address uh, our energy challenges because we are rich in, in terms of energy resource. But however, that potential that we have or that resource that we have has got to reach into our homes. It, it has to reach to where the consumers are. And uh, 
the integrated plan will definitely help us achieve that in a more systematic way. So as you note, we are, uh, our population is highly dispersed, so we can't have one form of reaching everyone. Some will extend the grid, but it's very expensive to extend to everybody. Therefore, the off-grid solutions will be very key. Some mini grids will also be very important for places where you've got high population concentrations. And uh, of course, the off-grid for those who are very scattered. So at that integrated approach or that combined approach will be very, very important. But one opportunity that we have is to do with, uh, on one side, we've got this excess generation capacity that's coming in and everybody's talking about that. On the other side, we've got over-dependence on biomass, which is not being used sustainably. You've had all these directives that are coming in to burn charcoal in some of the areas. But we note also that, um, especially around the urban areas, there is a very good opportunity for promoting cooking with electricity. And that's something that is on my heart. There is a new technology that many of you may not be aware of where you, you don't have to consume that much energy because it's a technology that is using, it's, it's well insulated. It has a thermostat and uh, it uses pressure, it raises pressure, that's an electric pressure cooker. It raises pressure. And as long as your pressure is high and the temperature is high, the cooking will continue irrespective whether or not you're consuming electricity. So it's something that I think we also need to integrate in our planning because we're solving two things. One, on the sustainability of biomass resource utilization, but also the excess power generation that uh, we, we, we go, we're grappling with. How shall we make it, how shall we get it absorbed? We've made some estimations that if 1 million EPCs were distributed, around 300 megawatts would be absorbed. But it comes with other challenges. As we noted in the report, the infrastructure is not well developed within the country. And therefore, we've got to improve our infrastructure in terms of um, transmission as well as distribution. So we, we, we have that opportunity that we can utilize our resources to solve some of those challenges that we have, but the, 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 the challenges remain issues of affordability. And uh, we, we, we are glad that we have this World Bank project, electricity scale project, which is also going to address some of those affordability issues, as well as um, the issues to do with behavioral change. We need to, I think, address the issue of behavioral change. I mean. Some people are biased. There is a perception, for instance, that cooking with electricity is very expensive. And actually through our program, MEX is going to promote the distribution of electric pressure cookers, starting with Umeme, because Umeme has been telling people that if your tariff, if your bill is high, it's like you're cooking with electricity. So we want them <laughs> first to appreciate that the technologies have changed, things have now changed and uh, our, Interactions we've had, the women people are very excited, but I, I, I believe that as we think about access, we need to plan access along with productive use. And one of the things is, can we also promote clean cooking with access programs? I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Banabe. I'm informed that some of the pressure cookers is mentioning here, we have a team do a demonstration at Tamba House in our Quadrango on Monday. So if you have a moment, you can walk past and see what is trying to describe how it works exactly. Please join me to in thanking the panel for ably making us appreciate this uh, unusual topic. Uh, we'll have uh, another 15 minutes to, to interact. Let's get some feedback from you. Let's, uh, uh, we need to know whether you're following through, whether you're appreciating the subject, whether you have a contribution or a question. Kindly give it to us in a minute. And where the panel needs to answer something, they should have a few other minutes to answer. There's a gentleman 
at the back and there is a lady here i think i'll take five please your name and briefly say what you want to say to us okay uh thank you very much once again my name is patrick edema and i work with the africa institute for energy governance an organization that uh, works to influence energy policies that benefit the poor and the vulnerable Ugandans. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, at least uh, the consultations by International Energy Agency uh, uh, participated in uh, one of the two consultation meetings and you are here. And I'm so excited that uh, I'm also part of this meeting of launching the report. Uh, I, I, the few issues uh, maybe I have is because if we are talking about the energy sector, how to look at the, also the energy transition plan, increasing access to electricity. The three components of uh, uh, increased access to electricity, the affordability, the reliability, uh, the distribution. These are so key components in ensuring that uh, the challenges within the electric sector are addressed. Recently, I was reading a report by, uh, of course, uh, International Energy Agents, and it was talking about the challenges of distribution that are going to that are limiting the efforts to energy transition. But also, as Uganda, we are looking at uh, the access to electricity by 60% by 2030, and uh, this is our target. But is this time really uh, enough for us? looking at the uh, statistics that we have, people who have access for this electricity and which kind of uh, work do they use for? Because most of the communities, especially the majority who are in local communities, they don't use uh, electricity for productive use. They use electricity just for lighting and they don't benefit from this electricity. Secondly, in the report, uh, we looked now at- uh, have to cut you oh, short. The last one, the last one, the last one. Yes, uh, the final one is the oil and gas. Because we are looking at the energy transition, and uh, if you look at, uh, like the commissioner said, that uh, we read all the, they read all the reports, and uh, the recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was launched in March this year, it said that uh, for us to meet the transition plans, the energy transition plans, we need to stop exploiting uh, the fossil fuels. So if we are putting oil and gas into consideration, yes, we said net zero is not about zero emissions, but this will limit our uh, efforts to ensure that uh, we meet the commitments under the Paris Agreement and other conventions of uh, net zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. The lady, uh, may I know whether we have other, other members who, who have something to contribute so we can plan the time. Uh, please. Okay, thank go. you so much. Uh, Once again, my name is Brenda Kankunda and I'm from the Department of Energy, Science and Technology and I'm a K University Business School. Just my observation goes to Ms. Serene. We really understand that energy is highly capital intensive. Okay, and we have the energy literacy gap. Uh, thanks to NREP, they have tried to recognize the universities, the higher learning institutions, but to the reality, the research, the innovation. I'm sure, Ms. Srin, when you're doing this, you found lack of disaggregated data, and it is a very big issue. So as researchers, how can we be involved? How can we really work? Because we have affordability issue. From an experiment that we did, we actually found that EPCs are cheaper compared to other options, followed by LPG. But the people are not aware about this, okay? So energy literacy remains a very key gap that universities need to do research innovation and also professionalization. We, you can agree with me that the solar sector, there are so many installers, there are so many technicians, but they are not professional, okay? So we have a lot of issues there. So I'm just wondering in this report, where are the universities? Where are the learning institutions? And how do you plan to bring them on board? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other before I close this interactive? The Honorable Minister wants to speak to us. The Honorable Minister of Energy. 
uh, Okasai Opalot. I'm going to limit myself to the discussion in front of us. Um, the first speaker actually shocked me and I, I will be interested to know why you are closing the embassy. <laughs> it is rather it's something of policy nature. Uh, we, have, we have enjoyed good relationships with the embassy and so on. And then all of a sudden, come June, July, it will be no more. We go back to working with, the, with you. Wow, that's important. Um, I believe we shall get, I think we have eight minutes, eight minutes. So each speaker here should say something in a minute and a half in, in relation to what you've heard from the gallery. Let's start with, uh, with NORAD. The minister is concerned. Yeah, thank you. And Honourable Minister, let me refer that question to uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador. Um, can, can I... <laughs> um, um, one one, small, one uh, encouragement from me. I, I really encourage you all to take a very close look at the financing chapter of the EIA report. Um, the challenges in being able to attain that uh, affordable funding is we we, uh, we we must not underestimate it. Uh, we are now fronting macroeconomic headwinds. The cost of financing is increasing, and study that figure where um, you get an illustration of how much more financing will cost if the governance and institutional framework is, is not in, in place. And I think this is really a very important follow-up discussion in the implementation of these policies, that you, you take a close and very undiplomatic look at, uh, at uh, your governance uh, challenges. Um, and it's both uh, within uh, and beyond uh, the sector. I, I think it's uh, going, going to be important discussion also on uh, how to rebundle uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, utility. That's, that's going to be an important one. And the expectation, the expectation is that this will save, this will promote efficiency. But I, I think we we know uh, all of us uh, from different countries, different institutions that enabling, making sure that you get that horizontal interaction between sectors, uh, institutions, and departments. Um, you 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 can't. It, it's not the putting everything into one institution doesn't always solve the matter. So I think uh, getting a clear idea of expectations, what you will be able to save uh, also in that reorganization process is, is going to be a key one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Stella, anything, did you pick anything that you want to speak to briefly? I have uh, five minutes to end this session. Okay, I pick up half of something. <laughs> so I'll speak to the half of, of uh, energy is a capital in, uh, intensive. And I think that's why it speaks to, to why we are trying to do coordination. We're here understanding that energy sector is a very capital uh, intensive uh, sector per se. Uh, and what we are really trying to do here, we are trying to coordinate ourselves as development partners, see, for example, how much investment is needed, but also recognizing that we can or not all just as development partners support the sector by ourselves. So we look at the instruments to leverage the financing from let's say private sectors and other stakeholders. Um, in terms of um, knowledge, knowledge gap and uh, bringing the higher institutions, I think that depends on country to country and there are different uh, frameworks. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a project where in Tanzania, 
we did work with a university, one of the university in Mwanza because of uh, providing data. So I think this there is a variation to country to country. And I think that part, I'll leave it to Dr. Jared maybe to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before Dr. Uh, Dr. Banaga speaks, the Honorable Minister of State for Mineral Development wanted to chip in. Uh, Honorable, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to address Her Excellency uh, very much. And what I have heard from my friend, the first speaker there, he choked us the way he has choked my friend. For me, I've been working with, uh, in touch with the Norwegian embassy for a long time. The success of our oil now, it has been Norway, which has been the backbone. They're advising us what to do in financing it. I was in the Ministry of Energy, I'm a Minister of Education, Years back, Norway was very prominent. And then I came to this ministry and went even to Ministry of Works. All that time, Norway has been our household name. Now to hear that you are going to shock us. But since you cannot change the policy, I would like to ask you to take our appreciation for you having been here before and say you could go when your financial situation stabilizes you could come back to uganda so we shall keep the embassy open when you think you are close the houses will be open you go away because we think you will come back. <laughs> so when you go there, don't forget us. Otherwise, our country is very grateful to you people. Take our best wishes to them and say, we wish you a happy return. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Honorable. That's a good message to our you know, our supporters, because Uganda is very blessed indeed to have you, to have worked with you for a very long time. Uh, so, Dr. Banaga, briefly. Yeah, um, I'm glad the, our political leaders have expressed that point. Um, yeah, so briefly, the issues of affordability, reliability, and all that is what we're trying to solve. In fact, one solution is just to grow the demand. Just grow the demand. You see, sometimes you can follow sales laws, supply creates a demand, but sometimes you have to go to Adam Smith, demand will optimize supply. Um, the desegregated data, the research institutions wait for the next stage because that's what we are sorting out. There is a lot of planning here in this, in, in this country, in this sector, um, but we are trying to aggregate that. That's why we're speaking of integrated. The one of oil, a few ago, the one of oil, I, I'm sure the, the ministers will speak to it. Um, our task, wait for the energy transition plan. What we've done is to model the role of oil in the country's energy transition plan. The energy transition plan is not a fit for all, no. And this was the challenge we had even at COP27. You know, last year, the other years, the force was high until we put in uh, an effort to push back and explain ourselves. And the question was, can you please show us your plan? Now, we have done this plan. By the way, rigorous, you know, a rigorous. And we'll present the role of oil in the transition. We even met the, the that member of parliament, I didn't know why they were referring from European with the minister, and he had a good chat with the minister, and we realized what they're doing. But now we have analyzed it properly, objectively, this country, and formulated the plan. And we believe analysis is not hedgy hedgy, it's robust. Uh, and by the way, 
we are probably some of the best trained and ex and knowledgeable people in this sector. You can Google us. So if there is an IPPC, please bring them to us. I'm happy to meet them and we have a real exchange, but the team, the work they have done is good to explain Uganda's plan and its utilization of its resources in while meeting our national and international obligations with regard to missions. We built to show that on the ETP. Just watch us the 5th of December when we launch it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Mr. Banabe. Maybe I'll speak to the issue that Fiego raises, wondering whether we can achieve the 60% level of access. Now that 60% includes off-grid, includes the solars. And if you look at the current statistics, I think we're around 50%. I, I see the commissioner sh shaking his head in terms of access. So it's, it's not a very high figure. Actually, it can be surpassed. But as you had, there's a challenge of standards. If the standards in the solar systems, especially, can be addressed, the current alternatives that people are using are even more expensive. And therefore, we need to do a lot of awareness and we would wish civil society helps us on that in terms of creating awareness that people can know that the clean energy forms actually help them providing better health, better lighting, and the like. And we've, we've a lot of interest, a lot of interest from the development partners with that World Bank project, with all these partners that are around, I'm sure that target can be reached. And uh, the plan, there are those who have said that we, we're waiting for that plan, that once they see the integrated plan, they will see how to come in. So. It's a target we can reach. Thank you. Thank you for the optimism. And uh, Sirin, we, yeah, you one minute. Even less. I, I again you. spoke too much um, <laughs> because also my other colleagues in the panel have already replied to, to all of the questions, I guess. But just to, to uh, conclude, uh, we're very pleased to, to also pursue this work in this uh, in-depth energy policy review, um, as mentioned many times, will feed in the energy transition plan. Uh, and I'm happy that this raised interest also to see how all the questions will be addressed in this plan. And we've had really length, um, lengthy discussions uh, with the, the Ministry of Energy of Uganda regarding uh, targets, also how to achieve these, which, which time horizon. So just stay tuned and be patient until the 5th of December for the launch of the next uh, uh, project, um, which is the Energy Transition Plan at COP28. And we'll be looking forward. Colleagues, let's put our hands together for the panel as I invite them off the stage now. So, Honorable Ministers, Permanent Secretary, the Deputy Executive Director of IEA, all protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, as we have heard here today, uh, Norway's cooperation with Uganda in the energy sector has been running for many years. And we believe that the results will have a lasting impact. The overall aim of this cooperation has been to support Uganda in achieving its stated objective of ensuring a better future for its citizens through developing its considerable energy and mineral resources ending energy poverty and leading the country uh, into a just energy transition. And now let me address the issue that has been taken up by the honorable ministers. Yes, I'm sure that it's a shock for many and I think it was for many within the Norwegian system as well. And as I have underlined to the honorable minister herself and also to the minister of foreign affairs and other officials on the Ugandan side, this is a purely uh, administrative uh, decision. We are closing down several missions, six this year and two next year. Um, and unfortunately, Uganda is among those. And it's, it does not reflect on the cooperation that we have had with Uganda. Uh, on the contrary, I think we are very proud of the cooperation we have had with Uganda within the, the energy sector. And I very much appreciate the kind words that have been said about the cooperation. And I, I think what you said about welcoming us back, that's the message that I have been given by all the others I have spoken to as well. It has been uh, the, the, the officials I've been talking to, the politicians, they have said, okay, they understand Uganda also at one point had to close embassies 
but they were opened again. They were reopened. So uh, I, I, I will bring that message back to Oslo, say that we will be, after we have closed in July next year, uh, we will be welcome back. And I think also I should emphasize that, as I said to, to, to Minister Odongo, uh, we, will, we hope to leave a solid footprint in Uganda, but not only a footprint, we actually, we actually hope to maintain a foot in Uganda. And I think the energy sector is really the area where we should look forward. And uh, there, are, there is so much engagement from the Norwegian side in the energy sector. And as you are aware, uh, a lot of the development cooperation to Uganda is already administered by NORAD, the development agency, and not the, not the embassy. So this will continue. So I think in spite of the fact that the embassy is closing July next year, we should have the courage also to look beyond July uh, next year. So back to the to the report and this launch. I think it's a very it's a thank you for a very very uh, good uh, uh, event, and it's been very interesting for me to listen to to all the uh, intervention and the, and the panel. And uh, uh, like like uh, other energy projects that Norway has supported over the years, uh, we are very proud to be associated with this study. And uh, we are definitely pleased to witness the launch of this uh, in-depth policy review report. And I should pick up what the, uh, the commissioner was saying about my predecessor, uh, Madame Elin Österberg Johansson. I know she was particularly interested in the energy sector and took us, she was very engaged in the work with IEA. And I know she would have loved to be here today. So I will definitely communicate with her uh, when I get back from this event. Uh, in the dialogue preceding this study, I think everybody has come to the realization that long-term energy planning is central to our country's strategic direction and energy security. Without that, governments may end up relying on a patchwork of policies and legislation that can be incoherent and ill-suited for the complex challenges countries are increasingly faced with. On this basis, the embassy, as part of its energy portfolio, decided to support the Ministry of Energy to work with IEA to create a reputable, consistent, and accurate energy data baseline from a globally trusted source that could be the first port of call for all national energy data. The report will not only provide a sound basis for evidence-based policy making, but it is an important tool of reference point for public and private investment, contributing to a sustainable energy sector. And we hope that this report will be one of the important tools for Uganda to use in positioning itself to attract much needed investment in the energy sector to provide clean, affordable, and more reliable energy alternatives. So I take this opportunity to congratulate IEA and the Ministry of Energy for the successful cooperation in completing the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for speaking to us and at least giving us the assurance that not all is lost, even after you leave. We'll have the agency here with us to continue with the work, with the good work you've been doing in this country. Um, allow me to invite the Deputy Executive Director of the IEA, Madam Mary Bruce Wallick, to speak to us. You're most welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
Honorable uh, Minister Okasai, Honorable Minister Lokeris, uh, Ambassador Hermanson, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, and valued partners. It's, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be uh, with you today at this uh, wonderful occasion. Um, it's been such an interesting morning listening to everyone uh, present and to participate um, in this uh, launch of the Uganda Energy Policy uh, Review, which the IEA has been very delighted to partner with all of you on. And um, I really want to begin by expressing my particular gratitude to the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development of Uganda for co-hosting this event and extending a very warm welcome to me and my IEA colleagues, uh, my colleague Serene in particular here in Kampala. Last year, I had the pleasure of launching another major IEA report on clean energy transitions in the greater Horn of Africa. Um, this event was uh, also co-hosted by the Ministry of Energy of Uganda right here in Kampala. Unfortunately, I was only able to join you remotely, but today I'm very delighted to be able to um, be here in person with all of you. So minister, uh, ministers, I would like to express our sincere thanks to you and your dedicated teams, in particular, Madame Irene Batebe, the Permanent Secretary, and Mr. Gerald Bananga Baingi, Assistant Commissioner Technical Planning, for the excellent collaboration on the Uganda Energy Policy Review, the first of its kind, as was mentioned, for the IEA in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's just been a great pleasure working with you, all of you, and thank you so much for your dedicated efforts in helping us collaborate on this. And um, Honorable Minister, your insights during the review uh, visit helped the IEA to understand the key challenges Uganda is facing and the commendable efforts the nation is taking to develop its energy sector and ensure universal access to energy. We at the IEA certainly have learned a lot through this process and through our close cooperation from the moment we started on this project um, back in January of this year. So we've come a very long way in a relatively short time. Um, but the IEA and the government of Uganda, um, as have been mentioned, have been engaged in a close and fruitful partnership for many years, uh, sharing energy data and knowledge. And of course, we look forward to continuing that great collaboration. And I certainly would like to express our sincere gratitude to you, uh, Ambassador Hermanson, for the work that you and your team at the embassy have, uh, have provided in collaborating on this um, and other energy programs here. Uh, in Uganda. Your unwavering support for this project has been truly invaluable. And uh, additionally, a big thank you as well to NORA, to the Norwegian uh, Agency for uh, Development Cooperation for your generous support for this project in particular, but more broadly to the IEA work right across the continent as, as has been described. And finally, I'd like to extend my thanks to the numerous stakeholders from the Ugandan government and the energy sector who supported the Energy Policy Review, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank my own colleagues, so Serene in particular, and also Rebecca Gagan, um, who is our division head for uh, this part of the world, and I know is uh, the, the team leader for uh, the Energy Policy Review early this year. So over a full week, our team met with 200 energy stakeholders in Uganda, and this experience has been extremely useful in helping us understand not only the energy challenges that Uganda faces, but also, of course, the many opportunities uh, that exist with the abundant resources that your country has. Um, these discussions were instrumental in shaping the report that we uh, are launching here today, which provides detailed insights into the Ugandan energy sector, highlighting the remarkable progress that Uganda has achieved in recent decades, uh, while also uh, suggesting recommendations for ways in which Uganda can further enhance its energy sector. And I, I, I trust and hope that our recommendations are very much taken in that spirit. The Ugandan government has set forth an ambitious agenda with clear objectives. And these objectives include developing its substantial energy and mineral resources to support rapid economic development, achieve universal access to clean cooking and electricity, enhance energy security and improve affordability all while maintaining sustainability. And Uganda really has a unique context. You have substantial energy and mineral resources, extensive technical expertise, well-defined government and policy frameworks, 
and a clear vision to transform into a modern and prosperous country as stated in your vision 2040. So with this report, we hope we've captured this unique context. And our aim really is to contribute to Uganda's upcoming milestones, your own milestones, particularly the energy transition plan in which our teams have also been actively involved in close partnership with the ministry. And we look very much forward to the launch of that uh, plan at COP28. This situational analysis serves as the foundation for Uganda's energy transition plan. And it assesses the entire energy sector uh, as was briefed already, I know by, by Serene, covering areas such as power, renewable energy, access to energy, uh, extractives, climate and environment, energy efficiency, and of course, investment, which we uh, heard loud and clear is just uh, uh, very, very important. And we just heard uh, from so many uh, colleagues today, some of the main findings and recommendations from the report. And I think it's really been a rich discussion. So I just want to thank everyone who's participated both in the preparation of the report and in the discussions today. And, and certainly we haven't had time to cover them all, but um, there are, uh, I hope you will agree, a number of interesting recommendations. So we really uh, encourage all of you um, who haven't had yet had chance to read the report. I know we have some printed copies available. It's also available uh, online on the IEA website. So you can always find it there. And the report, as I mentioned, really commends Uganda's progress over the past two decades in providing access to electricity and expanding generation capacity. And I think your future goals in this regard are very important. And it's truly impressive to note that the country's electricity sector is now predominantly based on renewable resources uh, with hydropower and solar PV sectors um, continuing to grow. Uganda has also made significant strides in energy balances and related data and is a leader in the region in terms of energy statistics. And uh, we thank you for the participation that you've also had in some of our uh, ongoing training programs. But we do also acknowledge, as has been mentioned, that some challenges persist, um, particularly in terms of consistent data, which is often linked to insufficient resources. And then another significant of cha challenge already described is in achieving universal access and reliable energy sources for electricity and, and clean cooking. And I think that's been well uh, recognized. And Finally, electricity represents only 2% of Uganda's final energy consumption with more than 85% uh, in the form of bioenergy, uh, mostly wood and charcoal consumed by households uh, for cooking. The government uh, surely recognizes these challenges and is taking uh, important and, and notable steps to address them, which will be described uh, in the upcoming energy transition plan as well. So at the IEA, as I mentioned, we really hope that this re report will help to identify a pathway to enable Uganda, um, your policymakers yourselves, uh, to achieve uh, the goals you yourself want to ensure secure, sustainable energy supplies that enable the country to prosper. Please consider us an ongoing partner uh, as you um, move forward. And uh, thank you so much once again for your kind hospitality today. It's been great working with all of you. Another round of applause for the De Deputy Executive Director. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Now we have one to go, but uh, Honorable Minister, I'm not competent to invite you. So I'll invite your colleague to greet, greet us and then invite you. Honorable Okasai, you're invited to invite your brother. Honorable Minister, Your Excellency, the Ambassador, um, the Director, Development Partners, and I see the rest of us are actually colleagues, technical. So I'm delighted to be here and given this opportunity. And um, 
I will actually start by appreciating the Norwegian ambassador for actually being always, she has always been there for us. And, and this road where we came from, came from Adina, where the ambassador, I was on leave, and then she insisted I must come for a dinner. And I had to travel all the way to come for a dinner. And then Serene and the team were presenting some data. Where is Serene? Yes. When they presented the data after the dinner, they almost ran out of their skins because I was so unhappy with what they presented. Because all they were presenting was from outside Africa. And I immediately said, no, this has to change in the presence of the ambassador. And uh, we went into a discussion after the dinner and what came out of the dinner is actually what we are witnessing today. Literally, a decision was made that day. We have got to generate and let have Uganda get the data to reflect where we would want to go. So thank you very, very much. That's why I was feeling so sad that you're saying you're leaving. I also want to thank um, the deputy chief executive officer. We are not meeting for the first time. We actually met and looked at where we wanted to go, giving direction to the technical people, where we wanted to, to go with developing this data. I had to leave my staff in France with her with a clear instruction of what I wanted. So I'm actually delighted the technical teams have worked so hard. We are not very patient with them. You have got to do it. And uh, Banaga had to stay in France with the team that we, I went with. I said, we are not going back to Uganda. Can you stay? By the time you return, I want a first draft. So thank you, Banaga, for actually taking the instructions seriously. And uh, when they were working, I, the first meeting which they had, there was a huge number from the other side. And I was very clear in my mind what I wanted. I wanted an integrated plan. And I actually gave the instructions here. I want, they had over 20 people from the other side. And I said, I want them matched one by one. If they had somebody on minerals, I wanted somebody from minerals here. Renewable energy, and it was in this room, I took a, a roll call. If somebody was not here, I would actually ring the, the PS and say, I want so-and-so here. And I'm so delighted with the outcome that we are witnessing today. What I wish to bring out clearly, getting out this policy review and call it integrated plan, to me is the beginning of the, the job. It is not what we expected. As I was listening to it, the outputs are very clear and they are really very good. But this should be our first edition. So this is the beginning of what we expect if we are to take this country forward. When they initially presented it to me, I asked a tough question again and I said, look, I'm not satisfied with this. We have got to get, call it a master plan, but I want something which is implementable. This is a framework. The framework will not take us where I would wish to go. So I would wish to thank the uh, African Development Bank to have actually taken my comment seriously because I wanted now something that we can implement. This is a framework, it's a policy, but we need to come up with it 
an integrated implementation plan, something which is which can be implemented and we can start monitoring ourselves. So thank you very much, African Development Bank, for jumping in before even our first edition came out. You are now a partner. And I'm delighted uh, the Norwegian Development Agency is here. We are going to work together. Whether the embassy closes or it is open, we are already partners in developing the next stage. I'll be knocking on your door. I'm not very sure the African Development Bank alone will take me where I want to go. I will actually be urging other development partners to come in, including the NA NGOs and um, the media. We need all of you. It's about us. This development is not about somebody else. It's about us. Can we lead? Because, yes, it is the first one in Southern Africa. But we have got to lead all the way, including the implementation of what we, we are developing. I don't believe that we shall lack the resources, where there is always a good program and you have determination to reach there, we shall be there. So uh, my friend, uh, the executive director of me, the development agency, don't get scared, get a good plan and we shall face, we shall face the way we move there. We are aware it is very expensive. The figures may be scaring, but break it down to implementable phases, and we shall be there. It's not about tomorrow, but a long future. So let's not be scared. Let's produce an excellent implementable document, and then we set out priorities. This is the comfort I would wish to give the partners. I'm so also delighted that we are signing an MOU with the uh, International Energy Agency. This is what I was looking for. Because in my hard question, why is this one elsewhere but not in Africa? And I actually didn't know the question I asked, can I get in? Can I be the first to get in? So thank you very much for actually allowing me to hack into a system which was not meant for us. Thank you, thank you very much. Signing of the MOU means we are now partners. I will not rush to what I was thinking that time. I was actually telling uh, International Energy Agency, how does Africa become a member? And I'm actually seeing us getting into it. Slowly, we shall be there. The data which you have produced is going to give us a planning tool which will enable us to be realistic in our plans, watching out how we shall transition to clean energy. To answer the question which one of the, the, the participants asked, fossil fuels. We are talking about fossil fuels, but it is not going to be like turning a tap and the water comes. It's going to be gradual. So nobody should be scared. And when you look into what's in fossil fuels, there are so many other uses. I have a background in agriculture. I need fertilizers and I will get them there. I will want to get the clothes. Uh, I, I get it from petroleum. There are so many alternative uses. Let's not focus just on energy. There are so many other uses which we can exploit and benefit from. This is a message we should go out. We shall continue investing in petroleum because of the diverse uses, including pharmaceuticals we can get them from the fossil fuels. 
the scientists are actually challenged to develop this. There is the, the academia. Why do you get scared? This is a framework. But in my mind, the implementation will start with technology development, and that's going to be your work. So you better be prepared for it. You are going to be captured when we are developing the implementation and investment plan, which is the next stage. So please pay attention when you are invited, be there. I will not want the questions to be asked when we are launching it. It should be our document. It is not my day to speak, but those are my dreams. I now wish to take this single honor to invite the minister who is going to talk now the policy. Mine is the thoughts. So, Honorable Minister, I invite you to make an official statement. Thank you. The minister has really talked well about energy and he has become energy himself. My colleague minister energy, because now energy is flowing in his, through his veins. The deputy executive director of International Energy Agency, your excellency, the Norwegian ambassador to Uganda, who is going away and coming back. We are going to pray until you, you change, those people change their minds and you come back because of the historical events that we have been having together. We have been friends for a long time. You are on Absence, we feel it, we shall feel it. Unless otherwise you leave somebody to be coming to meetings we shall hold here. The honorable members of parliament, chairpersons of boards of different sectors of the agencies, the permanent secretary and your representative from the government, MDS, esteemed colleagues from the International Energy Agency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm sure time is not yet yet ripe for lunch, so your energies and sugar levels are still intact. Therefore, I wish to continue. I stand before you today on a landmark occasion for Uganda's energy into a future powered and empowered by sustainable energy with a great honor and profound sense of responsibility. I was the launch of the in-depth review report of Uganda's energy sector in Kampala. This collaboration between the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development and the International Energy Agency marks a crucial step in accelerating our nation's energy transition as articulated in our national energy policy for the year 2023. Uganda is indeed rich with potential not only in our abundant natural resources, but in the spirit and determination of our people to harness these assets for our collaborative prosperity. We believe in times of great transformation, 
as our population grows, so does the demand for modern, clean, and efficient energy. The traditional reliance on biomass has been a testament to our resilience, but it also has a call for change, for innovation and sustainable way forward. Our energy consumption currently at about uh, 16,800 kilo, kilotons of oil equivalent must increase in quality and improve qual quality, accessibility, and reliability. The in-depth review we launched today offers a comprehensive assessment of our current energy landscape and a roadmap for achieving our energy goals. It brings to light the recommendations that align with Ugandan vision 2040 to transform into a modern and prosperous country. Key among the recommendations is developing and implementing an energy, an energy transition plan. This is not a mere aspiration, but a strategic road plan for action. For each through concrete plans that we can chart a path forward towards a low carbon climate resilient economy. We will embrace innovative technologies, seek new solutions, and align our strategies with international agreements, including the Paris Agreement. Improving our national energy statistics systems in a crucial, is crucial for evidence-based policy marking. Data is the foundation for effective energy management, and we shall strive to enhance our data coverage and quality capabilities. In addressing transmission bottlenecks and stimulating demand for productive energy uses are uh, urgent priorities. We aim to optimize our existing generation capacity ensure grid stability and reduce the cost of power, thereby extending services to more of our citizens. So you have been very instrumental even in giving us their money for extensions. Very soon we shall have a lot of power. And if we don't connect, it means there will be a diminished power, which we shall be continuing to pay without anybody enjoying their power. So that's why we need distribution and extension capabilities. Addressing transmission bottlenecks and stimulating demand. That is what we really want to do. We want to connect and then we stimulate demand. As we navigate the power sector reforms, we pledge our commitment to clarity and transparency to all stakeholders. Our commitment today is the continuity of investment and maintenance within our distribution grid during this transition period. You see, many people are about talking about, today we are talking about energy transition which means we move without the disruptions to achieve that decarbonized world. You cannot just move now when you don't have anything to put here. You just have an idea to move and we have started. That's why the minister was talking about the fossil fuel. And people are wondering why we are moving ahead. Because of so many things happening to the world, which at times disrupt continuity. All of you know how the world is now. 
There are some planes running around bombing other areas, disrupting the supply of certain things, which means we should have this oil as we transition. And then as you are transitioning, this oil has different, uh, different uses. I don't know whether in Norway you have already got uh, some uh, subsidy for tarmac, tarmacking the roads. It is raining here now. We need bitumen to put it there so that we remove the pot oil from Kampala so that you, you drive very well. Plus other uses, they are there still. But we shall go slowly until we reach there. Some companies have already invested in the infrastructure of this oil. We need them to get this as we trans, uh, transform, uh, transition as we move slowly towards the attainment of clean energy uh, in the world. Access to electricity remains a fundamental pillar of our national agenda. We are steadfast in our pursuit to ensure that every connection brings light, catalyzes economic development, and energizes the productive sectors of the economy. The National Clean Cooking Strategy, which is also under development, will cover various technologies and consumer needs. Sustainable biomass, operations and awareness raising initiatives will complement this strategy as will financial incentives and technical program assistance. In alignment with the extractive industries, transparency initiative, Uganda will uphold the highest transparency and responsible management standards for our growing oil sector. Our goal is to ensure that the revenues generated from our oil resources are a blessing that uplifts our nation, fueling economic and social and sustainable development. Investment in our mineral resources, particularly in the critical minerals necessary for the global transition to renewable energy is another avenue we are actively pursuing. You see, this is a very good thing. As we transition, then you see the minerals are very necessary for the development of what transforms that transition. You need the lithium, you need all these critical, critical minerals. Good enough, they are here. We only need to develop them so that we transition when we have the necessary the gadgets to do to go. We are committed to financing further exploration and prioritizing areas with the highest potential for the sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, energy efficiency is a catalyst for development through incentives and dedicated funding investments will promote the adoption of energy saving technologies and the update of immobility, ensuring that every Ugandan can benefit from sustainable energy solutions. Public-private partnerships will be instrumental in realizing these goals. We will identify critical sectors and projects that can benefit from such collaborations. Designing financing structures that serve our, our nations and interests and those of the investing partners. So we want a win-win a win -win situation. Those investing must recover what they have invested and their profits. And our country 
allows you to repatriate what you have made. In conclusion, we chart this course for a sustainable energy future. We do so with the understanding that it is not just electricity we generate that will drive us forward. But the collective determination of our people, ingenuity, and offering commitment to progress. I thank the International Energy Agency for their partnership, all the contributors for their insights, and everyone present today for their commitment to a brighter, more sustainable future for this country. I thank the Royal Norwegian government through our excellence, the ambassador, for being a trusted partner. I thank all our partners in the energy, petroleum, and critical mineral sector, the development partners, the investors, and the key players who make things happen. We, these people here who make things, they work every day and night to deliver our energy, petroleum and mineral services. Without them, we will not be moving very far. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our technical teams we have, who have ensured that this task is undertaken with the highest level of proficiency it deserves. The International Energy Agency team, led by Mrs. Rebecca Gagin, Ms. Seren El Abed, our Ugandan team, led by the permanent secretary, who is now replaced temporarily by the one who read the papers, and Dr. Gerard Banaga Bahingi, who is the overall task team leader for this project, and all the officers who have worked on this task. I thank you very much. I wish you well when you go to your respective areas or good in our country. We better energize the world. Thank you.